So then, Mr. Winston, are you the counterbalance? Your, your title is Executive Director, California Strategic Growth Council. So I'm a, just maybe elaborate a little bit. We're all on his board, so he can only, <laughs> oh. he can only counterbalance yeah. so much. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, you know, we've got to make sure that we're not jeopardizing the goose, right? So is that what your responsibility is? So, I mean, as, as, as Secretary Laird and others mentioned, they've, uh, the, the, the council consists of, of agency secretaries and, and public members. And so um, really at our core is, is as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, advancing sustainable communities, which does include a lot of the components of um, some of the programs that were discussed earlier. Um, it's why when we've formed our programs, particularly affordable housing and sustainable communities and sustainable agricultural lands and conservation, we've done so in cooperation with all of, all of these agencies. So literally staff at each of those agencies um, uh, uh, coordinate with, within the Strategic Growth Council to create the programs. The Department of Conservation within the Resources Agency implements the Sustainable Agricultural Lands and Conservation Program and the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency implements the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. And so, you know, with, within our purview, um, again, with, of sustainable communities, we, we do very much bring together at a staff level um, uh, 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 priorities of each agency and, of course, subject to approval by, uh, by the council. Well, I'm, I'm a little more encouraged, but, you know, the last thing we want to do is encourage good corporate citizens to move to another state. And if greenhouse gases respect no borders and then we haven't we haven't come out ahead right so i i just want to make sure that we're finding some some good balance what, what are we doing to provide carrots instead of sticks it's a good question um i, I think again within uh, uh the the context of affordable housing and sustainable communities it's the opportunity to uh, uh i think at its core co-locate co -locate housing and transportation in a way that gets at some of the co-benefits that actually uh, Senator Allen, before he left, left was, was, was getting at, like uh, uh, closer proximity to jobs um, and accessing some of the economic benefits that we know uh, accrue from um, more, dense and in, 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 more dense and compact development patterns. Um, and, and, and proving that. And so some of that data, again, will, will be made available here in March. Um, but we also have, and I'm happy to share with you, um, uh, a complete data set of those benefits that came out of our first round of funding and from 2014 to 2015, um, which, which sort of walks through um, what, we, what we've uh, uh, shown to be the, the, the benefits of the projects that we funded. Well. Not that I want to go down this line, but you kind of bring up a point where I'm finding that there's a real disconnect between trying to get people closer to their jobs and a CEQA that seems to be the hindrance. And I'm wondering, do you have any? <laughs> is, is this is, hearing is the, going to go five o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not done yet. I'll, I, I'm going to get to you. Probably, I'm going to ask the easy questions first. <laughs> Senator, so, focus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just, just curious if you would mind looking at that a little bit. But my next question um, is to uh, Secretary Laird. Um, one, uh, thank you very much for meeting with me. You met with me twice, and I, I'll give you an update on our last meeting, so thank you for, for that. But I served on a retirement board for 12 years, and we had a robust timberland portfolio. And so you get to meet the money managers and the, the, the land managers, and the last, the last thing you want with Timberland is to have it next to a state forest or a federal forest, because the federal government and the state government just don't know how to manage forests. So I'm wondering, convince me that you're being involved a little more with our forests is a good thing. What a broad question. Uh, um, actually, it is a good thing. And the thing about it is, is we only have, uh, uh, in terms of state forest lands, Jackson SoCal demonstration, there's another one, a very small number of forest lands that are always, uh, on. it is really in the state responsibility areas for fire. Uh, are we doing the kind of management with private landowners and within 
uh, uh, urbanized areas that might not be incorporated that are in that responsibility area, are we doing what it takes to best protect against fire and manage whatever it is in there? And we are working very hard to do that. And I think the hardest thing is, is when I visited the uh, Butte fire in Calaveras County, it burned hotter and harder than many fires in recent memory. Uh, people usually thought, okay, if it because it, it burns before, if it hits that ridge, we know to get out. All those benchmarks were off the table. It was burning much faster. And in the first day, Cal Fire was really dropping to protect transportation exits for people rather than starting to put up the uh, other containment lines. And so things have changed, and that's why, ironically, it puts much more onus on us to prepare with fuels management, to prepare in concert to protect urbanized areas that are on the edge of forest land, and uh, uh, that's what we're working really hard to do. Thank you. Then. Secretary Kelly, uh, the Legislative Analyst Office says that uh, high-speed rail says uh, provides a relatively minor reduction in greenhouse gases. So, how do, how do we make high-speed rail the biggest chunk of of this uh, uh, cap and trade? Uh, well. You know, in 2014, we had the discussion here uh, and in the uh, Assembly Budget Committee about uh, utilizing cap and trade for various programs. Uh, there were specific questions about the, econo the greenhouse gas benefit of high-speed rail. Uh, they prepared and submitted a report to the public and the legislature uh, identifying about a three and a half million, uh, uh, million uh, metric ton reduction in CO2 when it, when it implements service. Uh, growing to a much greater reduction over time. Uh, and uh, at the conclusion of that conversation, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, a, a recipient of, of funding. Uh, for that reason, and I think because uh, to achieve all of our sustainability and climate objectives in California, we do have to find uh, ways to move people around the state uh, cleaner and faster and more integrated, and we think the project achieves that. Uh, we think it's an embarrassment today that it's 12 hours to take a passenger train from L.A. to the San Francisco Bay Area. We could do better. Um, and so for all those reasons, we support the program. We brought it here. We went through an analysis. It was peer-reviewed by ARB. It was peer-reviewed by the peer review committee that oversees high-speed rail. The estimates were found to be reasonable and credible. And, um, and so that's what we put forth. I would just say also as an observation, that globally, where high-speed rail is uh, in service, uh, it's got great uh, GHG reductions in place after place because between two destination cities, what you see when high-speed rail uh, comes online generally is a reduction in air and car travel between those cities and a great growth in, uh, in high-speed rail service and, and passenger ridership. And that's, that's in place after place after place. That kind of mode change has huge GHG implications. Senator, thank you very much for your questions. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you won't mind. Senator Roth is actually going to get the last question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment and then a question, I promise. Um, finance, you spoke to a cost-benefit analysis, and it looks to me like, it seems to me that a lot of rigor has gone into developing the cost estimates associated with this spending plan, but... In order to do an effective cost-benefit analysis, you need to know both the cost and the benefit. And I'm not certain that, at least in some of the areas, that um, the same degree of rigor has been applied to the benefit analysis as has been applied to the cost analysis. Secretary Laird brought us back on point. Uh, this is a greenhouse gas reduction program. That is how it was sold to the public. That is how we have articulated it here. And while there may be co-benefits that that benefit other areas, that fund many of the bills that we're able to get through the legislature and those that the governor does in fact sign. Um, we need to in fact focus on greenhouse gas reduction and the benefit that these programs actually uh, provide. So I guess in the future I would certainly suggest and request that uh, as the bean counters here in Sacramento that you apply that degree of rigor uh, to the benefit piece because otherwise I don't know how you rank order the programs. 
Yes, thank you. Um, and yes, uh, I think you'll find it in the March report from last year, as well as the March report uh, that's coming out this year, that you'll see uh, a lot of rigor uh, based on scientific methodologies uh, approved by the Air Board, that uh, you'll see uh, what the emission reduction benefit of the programs are. Thank you. And I look forward to that. And there was a comment made by one of the presenters that in terms of outcome that we'll prove it up at the end, you know, I think we owe it we owe more to the people that are providing this $3.1 billion or $3 billion. We owe more than simply proving it up at the end. We need to have periodic assessment and periodic reporting. Maybe that's going on, and maybe the failure is simply um, in terms of communication with the legislature. So I'll look forward to the March report. And Mr. Chair, one final question has to do with those of you who have been doing the um, greenhouse gas um, reduction estimates and assessments, um, and you're right, we have to start with estimates because you use estimates to set goals and objectives. So my question is what assessment process has been developed and if there has been one developed, is it internal to your various departments or is it a statewide assessment protocol that's applied across the board? Does that make sense? By assessments, I'm talking about Measuring, calculation. measuring the <clears throat> estimates against the goals and objectives and, uh, and developing uh, a report of outcomes. Well, that's not unique just to me, but with the ones that are in our area, <clears throat> we really have to work on a case-by-case -case basis to determine w w what is a methodology that uh, that is true in even just the estimate. And that's where there's been a significant amount of debate. And I think that's where there had been a disconnect with some of the stakeholders and at times with the legislature, because there was a view that on a policy level we should do these certain things, but there had not been a process that said this is exactly how they meet greenhouse gas reductions. This is exactly how you would determine the greenhouse gas reductions. And so we go through that process on each one. And that's why the one I described on fire and, and forest was particularly difficult. And we really had to look at a broader landscape basis rather than a project by project or area by area. Do you anticipate that each department is going to have to develop its own protocol, its own assessment protocol? and It's done in conjunction with ARB so that there is this uniform uh, application, but a lot of times the department might have to take the first stab in conjunction with them. Yeah, well, I think that's certainly what we're going to need here in order to understand why we're approving the expenditure of three billion dollars in these various areas and in defending our action because it is not an insubstantial amount of money in the state of California. So I look forward to the report. I look forward to working with each one of you and Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience. The public comment first. Okay. Thank you, Senator Roth. Uh, thank you to Mr. Albee, to our secretaries and to our director for your hours with us today. And I hope as you go back to your agencies and departments that uh, you know we encourage greater detail, as Senator Roth has just spoken of. We encourage trailer bill language. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, you bet. Uh, I know we have a very patient public waiting to speak, so I sense that there's a line forming already. Are there any others who are going to join this line? I'm just trying to get a sense of how many people we have. One, two, three, four. So I know you've been very patient. We're all ears. And at the same time, if you can be succinct, keeping comments to maybe a minute or so, we'd be very appreciative. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and committee members who are left with us. Uh, really enjoyed this discussion and excited to see the legislature taking a keen interest in this topic. My name is Sakita Grant, legal counsel with the Greenlining Institute. Uh, we are a social justice uh, nonprofit. We work on providing opportunities of economic advancement for low income communities and communities of color. I will go through my comments very briefly. I will say that I had a couple colleagues who left, left me in the dust early to uh, catch meetings in planes, so I'm carrying some of their comments, um, and we'll do so quickly and also remind, me, remind them they owe me a drink or coffee later. Um, you can also so, submit them to the committee. Okay, okay, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, very quickly, I wanted to support comments made by Senator Pavley about the urgency of the 1516 funding that was uh, unspent. This is very critical, and I'll talk a little bit about programs that it will address. Um, and also wanted to support uh, Senator Mitchell's comments around looking at workforce and uh, looking at technical assistance in, in the way that we're funding. It's very important that the disadvantaged communities that are more, most impacted actually have the ability to reach this funding. Um, and so the last two points I'll make are around the uh, low carbon transportation funding. This is really, really critical. It's going to some uh, established as well as new programs that are really directed at low income households and low and moderate income purchasers. We have exciting electric vehicle car sharing programs, van pooling in the Central Valley. Uh, we have a scrap and replace program that's been doing well and, and some successful medium heavy duty programs that are now without funding and it's really critical that we move that money. Um, and finally, I'll speak on behalf of the uh, 535 Coalition to say that uh, really, as you all are assessing this, to think uh, top of mind about disadvantaged communities, 10% benefit and 25% uh, to, excuse me, 10% in and 25% benefit. And um, particularly the transformational climate communities is an exciting program that uh, Mr. Winston spoke to and asked you guys to provide ideas on how to spend that 100 million. I, we think that's fantastic. We wanna emphasize support for that and really emphasize again, the support for disadvantaged communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Good afternoon, Chairman Leno, members, uh, Paul Mason, Pacific Forest Trust. And I just wanna briefly hit on a couple of things. It was really nice to see the Legislative Analyst Office highlighting the value of making investments outside of the capped sectors. And that aligns really nicely with the increased funding for the resource programs. In particular, um, we work a lot in the forest sector. And so it's really gratifying to see a significant investment um, in forests where we do have a colossal challenge to deal with the implications of the policies of the last 100 years. As uh, Secretary Laird said, it is more complicated, but we absolutely do need to, uh, to deal with that in a meaningful way. I just wanna make two quick points. One that Senator Walk highlighted, and that's the need to really coordinate these different grant programs very closely and carefully. You have healthy forests and you have watershed restoration, then you have some other things lower in the watershed. They're very largely the same thing. So we need to make sure that these programs are hand in glove and we don't fall into different agency silos that's so easy to do. So I think it'll be important for the legislature to press on that issue. My last point is that in the forest context, it's easy to focus largely on the need to deal with our dense forests that are at high fire risk and clearly we're gonna to wanna to do a bunch of thinning, community protection, that sort of stuff. We also need to be taking a longer term look at how do we want these forests to look in 50 years or 100 years? How do we get back to a forest that looks like we want it to look with big trees, widely spaced, and that's gonna require a longer term plan and a mechanism for actually changing management. And that's where conservation easements come in out there on the landscape as part of a combined program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Leno, uh, members and staff, uh, Rico Mastrodonato at the Trust for Public Land. Uh, we're supportive of a number of things in the expenditure plan, uh, including healthy forests and the transformational climate communities, but I'm gonna confine my comments to uh, the urban greening program that uh, is proposed in the budget. Um, you know, this is based on the Prop 84 urban greening program. Uh, and there's, uh, at this point, extensive academic and international research demonstrating the direct GHG benefits of multi-benefit green infrastructure projects in urban areas. These are the kinds of projects, uh, green alleys, river parkways, greenways, parks, open space, that get people out of their cars on short trips, lowering uh, VMTs. They cool the ambient air temperature, resulting in uh, energy efficiency. So those direct GHG, uh, GHG benefits are quantifiable and the methodology, methodologies are well established. But these kind of projects are also what uh, we need are an imperative in my mind in the new earth uh, 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 you know, climate change world. Uh, we have severe storm events, sea level rise. We need to be able to absorb these, uh, 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 the water that comes down here, capture that, uh, protect ourselves uh, from sea level 
level rise in severe storm events. So gr multi-benefit green infrastructure is our projects that can help us do that. Um, we think that when you stack the health benefits and other benefits, this really hits a sweet spot of a lot of the policy objectives of the state. And $20 million is a great uh, start, and we look forward to working with the legislature and uh, agencies to see uh, what we can do to increase that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh Chairman and members, uh, I'm Linda Escalante, policy advocate on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC. Three points, uh, we recommend spend the money, act now on fiscal year 2015 and 2016 expenditure plan and don't roll into uh, FY 16 and 17 budget. It's important statewide programs like clean vehicle rebates for cars, trucks, buses, and low income scrap and replace pilot programs in the South Coast and San Joaquin Valley that are at risk of going dark absent of any legislative action. There's no need for a reserve. The geo projections are overly conservative. The state should put the dollars to work to bring clean energy and its associated benefits to Californians. More delay means more missed opportunities. Second, increase funding for low carbon transportation and mobility options. We know the transportation sector is the largest source of GHG emissions and localized air pollutants. Equity programs developed pursuant to SB 1275 and 1204, this is a charge ahead, need funding to scale up and deliver benefits more broadly. Funding the existing active tra transportation program instead of the GEO's proposed low carbon roads program. We support to focus on short-lived climate pollutants and increase emphasis on targeting benefits to disadvantaged communities through integrated programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Estelante. Good afternoon, Adam Coton with the California Climate and Agriculture Network. Uh, I want to thank everyone for a very robust discussion today. Um, we are very supportive of the natural and working lands investments the governor has proposed, in particular those related to climate smart agriculture, uh, programs at CDFA including the Healthy Soils Initiative, the State Water Efficiency Enhancement Program and the Dairy Methane Reductions Program, um, also the Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation Program through the SGC and Resources Agency that was discussed today. Um, we have some, some policy considerations that we'll include in a, a letter delivered to the committee and to some of your offices, but also wanted to emphasize, um, I, sort of echoing something that Paul Mason said a moment ago about um, wanting you know, trying to avoid the siloization of some of these uh, efforts and really recognizing the value that can come from the interagency collaborations, uh, which in particular can be seen in the agricultural investments that are proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Juan Altamirano. I'm uh, Associate Director of Public Policy with Audubon, California. First of all, we want to commend the administration uh, for the commitment to natural working lands. We also support uh, Senator Pavley's position uh, to invest the rest as soon as possible. And, uh, and then my last point uh, is going to be really related on wetlands uh, and, and in the context of natural working lands. Uh, these lands are our major storage uh, banks for removing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and storing it in soils and vegetation. These are, these are vital eco, uh, ecosystems uh, that protect communities from sea level rise and storm surges, very similar to the comments that were previously uh, echoed. So I want to make sure that that continues to be at the forefront of any piece of of, uh, of you know, investment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Leno and members. Thanks for staying. I'm Bonnie Holmes Jen with the American Lung Association in California. And I uh, briefly wanted to underscore the importance of these funds um, as critical achieving, to achieving our air quality and health goals in California. And just to remind uh, everyone, uh, we, we still do have some of the worst air pollution in the country. And we absolutely need these funds to move forward on zero emission uh, transportation. We need to transform the transpor the, our transportation sector. And we have projects ready now to fund, uh, to transform cars, trucks, buses, goods movement uh, to zero emission. Um, we also need to focus on robust transit systems and uh, active transportation, including walking, biking, uh, and sustainable communities. We've, we've supported, we've sent you letters asking for at least $350 million focused in, in this year's budget on the zero emission transportation programs and increases in funding for active transportation um, and environmental justice. Um, so we look forward to working with you on that. And just to, to close with the critical need to get last year's funding out now, and I know this came up and we look forward to working with you on this. It's so important uh, to send those signals that we, we want to fund those projects today and get those benefits today. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Julie Malinowski-Ball with the California Electric Transportation. So we're going to actually echo the comments that you've heard about getting funding, the 1516 funding out as soon as possible. You actually heard from Secretary Rodriguez that these are programs, especially in the low carbon transportation sector, these are programs that this legislature has approved and directed to be money to be spent on. Uh, there are programs that will be going dark starting in March. This legislature does not want to see those programs on hold, uh, especially when it has an opportunity to move the money and move the money out now. And once we do that, then we can talk about the long term. You know, what should we be doing? Should we be doing this year to year? Is this the right thing for these types of programs? Or should we be doing two year, three year allocations? And if we're doing that, then we need to figure out then what exactly those goals are for each of those programs. So Cal ETC, you know, is at the table identifying what those projections should be for the next three years for low carbon transportation in particular and hope that you are, you're open to doing something more than just year to year funding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Michael Bocadoro, West Coast Advisors on behalf of a couple of our uh, various clients in the firm. I, I wanna go back to the conversation that was had with the Legislative Analyst Office and this concept of you are getting a lot of requests for GGRF funding and how do you measure those against each other? And I wanna introduce a really important concept and it's called return on investment. And we really need to take a hard look. Um, we were part of a study that was done earlier this year with Rambo and Viron that looked at all the existing programs that have been funded and how that funding uh, has returned uh, uh, investment to this, uh, an ROI to the state in terms of GHG reduction. You need to look beyond that, looking at petroleum reduction, looking at uh, benefits to disadvantaged communities, looking at other criteria pollutant benefits that can be provided. But a good starting point for everybody who's bringing projects to you would be to bring some analysis of what the return on investment that the state is going to get from investing in their types of projects. And then with that, um, the area where you really see a good return that came out of the study uh, is the area of urban landfill diversion and we need to take advantage of existing capacity in our wastewater agencies, which we have a number of in this state. They have a lot of capacity to take a lot of food waste. We don't have to build new infrastructure. Just need to get that um, food waste into those urban wastewater treatment uh, digesters that already exist. And then dairy digesters is the other area where there is tremendous bang for the buck. You heard this from uh, Secretary uh, Ross earlier today, and dairy digesters return more value to the state for every dollar invested than just about any other program currently being funded. Uh, they got about a $35 million funding level in the governor's proposed budget. That needs to increase significantly, particularly if we're going to achieve the short-lived climate pollutant reductions that CARB is looking for. And that's my final point, and that is the short-lived climate pollutants got a little short shrift in the governor's budget, about 10% of the funding they're a significant um, part of the solution, and we really need to think about generally stepping up um, more funding for short-lived climate pollutant reductions. Okay. Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Vanessa Kahina with KP Public Affairs on behalf of the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California. We would ask that the Senate take a look at some of the additional co-benefits of public health dealing with um, a possible use of cap and trade dollars. Our colleagues in the assembly did allocate $4 million to invasive mosquito research. And we think that this is an important use of funding, which is one of the less obvious impacts of warming climates, but these invasive mosquitoes, which are spreading viruses and other parts of the world and have had increases in West Nile virus here in California are thriving in warmer climates with lower levels of water. So we would ask you to consider this proposal as well and we'll be submitting some additional comments to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kahina. Good afternoon, Chair and members. My name is Vincent Waratmaja on behalf of the California Biomass Energy Alliance and IHI Power Services Corporation. Uh, we would just like to strongly urge you to consider the use of GGRF funds to address the tree mortality crisis that faces our state. At last count, there are 22 million tre dead trees in our state's forests that present a massive wildfire risk and a massive GGRF, uh, greenhouse gas uh, risk. As when the trees burn, they will release all that carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, biomass plants are the only technology that can adequately and timely address this crisis, and we strongly urge you to use GGRF money to ensure that this technology will be around to face down this issue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Mr. Chair and members, Tim Schott on behalf of the San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District and uh, wanted to encourage the legislature to consider increasing the uh, GHG uh, fund allocations for both of the transit programs, um, the TERSIP and the ELSHOP, if you will and uh, recognize the transit is a key component of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Appreciate that consideration. Also on behalf of the California Association of Port Authorities, which is comprised of the 11 commercial publicly owned ports, we encourage you to keep uh, freight and the improvement of freight systems and reduction of emissions related to freight uh, foremost in your mind as well. As the state engages in the development of the Sustainable Freight Action Plan, uh, pursuant to the governor's executive order that he issued in July, um, we're going to need significant state assistance to make sure that we accomplish his three goals. And that includes transitioning to zero emission technologies. We believe the state needs to take a leadership role in uh, helping to achieve the technologies that don't exist today that we need in order to achieve our greenhouse gas goals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schott. Chairman and members, Kelly Jensen representing Recology. Recology is the largest composter in the state, and we want to indicate our support for the administration's commitment uh, to Cal Recycle uh, and their um, waste diversion goals. Uh, as Senator Monning indicated, um, commodity costs are uh, creating significant difficulties uh, in the recycling industry. Uh, and we will want to make sure that uh, the infrastructure needed for composting facilities uh, and those funds are available going forward. Thank you. Jensen. Thank you, Chairman uh, Leno and members. My name is Taylor Glass. I'm here on behalf of CalStart, um, Valley Clean Air Now, and CalVans. We support uh, the investment in low carbon transportation, specifically um, incentives for light, medium, and heavy duty uh, zero emission vehicles, especially um, getting those vehicles into disadvantaged communities. Um, additionally, uh, given that the uh, transportation sector accounts for about 40% of the state's GHG emissions, um, it is imperative that these funds um, get out the door as quickly as possible. As other folks have noted, there are programs that are drying up and are ready for these funds. And lastly, um, we also support uh, investments in um, car sharing and van pools for farm workers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glass. Good afternoon, Nick Lapis with Californians Against Waste. I want to touch quickly on the cow recycle funding. Uh, I know this has come up repeatedly, but it tends to get sort of lost in the, in the shuffle a little bit because it's one of so many different programs. But as LAO has highlighted, as Department of Finance has highlighted, uh, the cow recycle program is actually a model for all the other agencies. It is the single most cost-effective program. It, is the, the first, it was the first to get the money out the door. It was the most oversubscribed program. It had the most public and transparent process. And it probably has the best metrics of any program in any agency. And uh, frankly, I really wish we could replicate this model with other agencies. And, and CalRecycle has set this uh, vision of, in order to achieve our show of climate pollutant goals, and our other co-benefit goals, we need to get organics out of landfills by 2025. And the legislature has passed multiple bills over the last few years to get us there. The administration's working on several different regulatory paths, but the funding is really the third leg of the stool, so we urge your support of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lapis. Kieran Flaherty, the University of California State Budget Relations, uh, speaking in support of the governor's proposal for $25 million for energy efficiency and buildings and reduction of future utility costs for the University of California. Uh, we also had approved in the region's budget last November uh, a request for an additional proposal uh, to partner with the state moving forward for, for future cap and trade funds. So uh, we appreciate your interest and appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flaherty. Last. All right. Hi. I'm Rondal Snodgrass. I represent a group of landowners and nonprofits that are involved in about 200,000 acres, about 312 square miles of forest on the North Coast. And my brief message is, is that when you review your greenhouse gas reduction funds, take a very close look as to actual how much is going to carbon sequestering. Because you're looking at you know, the three things, lowering emissions, adaptation, and sequestering. I think it's alarming that less than 5% 
of the 3.1 billion is actually going to sequester carbon. And that is one of the primary goals of Pope Francis encyclical, the Paris Agreement, Jerry Brown, and the pedal hits the metal for you. This is a chance for every senator and every assembly member to have a positive effect on world climate. The forests of the North Coast are as important as the Brazilian rainforest and the Indonesian rainforest. Redwoods and Douglas fir are not subject to bark beetle attacks. So there you have a perpetual motion machine that's been working for eons that will create carbon sequestering forever. It's done through conservation easements and acquisitions. I encourage you to look a careful look at the budget. Thanks a lot for staying so long. Have a great lunch. Bye. I wasn't last. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, Ryan Kenny with Clean Energy. We're the nation's largest provider of natural gas transportation fuel. And just uh, two quick uh, comments. One of which is uh, to uh, build support for what's called the uh, Biofuels Initiative, and that is to support um, uh, funding for biofuels production and infrastructure development here in California. As you might know, uh, California has um, the feedstock and the uh, ability to produce more biofuels, but because of regulations, a lot of it, especially about biomethane, is produced out of state. So that's one way to, that we could reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And also looking at uh, low NOx heavy duty trucks as well. ARB did certify a low NOx engine back in uh, September at a uh, 0.02 NOx. And it's a game changer for uh, the environmental goals of California. So we do uh, encourage uh, uh, you to look at uh, both of those things to help uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. You did have the last word and right on a minute. Thank you. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, Senator, Senator <clears throat> just a closing observation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very successful hearing. Uh, as we proceed, I want to continue to uh, retain my concerns as we uh, will continue to deliberate about the, the expanded uh, authority here through executive order. I think that's of great concern, and we're going to have to take a very close look at that. Uh, there are some legal issues here that I think uh, are nagging and of great concern. And in addition, the continuous appropriation, and there needs to be some accountability in this, a lot of money here, and I'm going to try to be working and seeing if we can come up with some mechanisms to give the legislature greater control and accountability. That's uh, just a conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I think we have a number of concerns in common, especially with uh, accountability and evaluation and oversight so that the legislature is not abrogating its responsibility through these continuous appropriations. So thank you all for staying with us. We are adjourned. Very good. Always great.